Good evening everyone. Thank you for joining us today. A very warm welcome to the second plenary session for the CoreNet Conference 2022 where we will be discussing supporting resilience organized in partnership with ID Insight. The discussion this evening will aim to highlight key learnings from how communities adapted during COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic brought about various adversities for large groups of people in India. Today, we would like to understand the many actions and adaptations of general populations, households and communities, and the actors that enable them to do so, such as specialized collaborators, crowdfunding platforms, and civil society organizations that supported the system's response to the health and economic crisis. We are very excited to start the discussion today. The moderator for this evening is Dr. Divya Nair. Dr. Nair is the Senior Director at ID Insight based in New Delhi. She aims to enhance the use of data and evidence for decision making and works regularly with governments, nonprofits, and others. At ID Insight, she led learning partnerships in sectors including agriculture, financial inclusion, sanitation, capacity building, and nutrition. She has conceptualized and overseen the growth of these partnerships, deployed a range of analytical tools, and driven towards social impact. Dr. Nair is passionate about improving the lives of the poorest, particularly women and children. Joining Dr. Nair, we have three wonderful panelists for today. The first is Ms. Priyanka Dutt. Ms. Dutt is Director, India Hub for Giving Tuesday, the global generosity movement that reimagines the world built on shared humanity and radical generosity. With two decades of experience across private, uh, across private and development sectors, Ms. Dutt is a seasoned social impact leader with a particular expertise in the use of media and communication for social impact. Ms. Dutt has worked extensively on maternal and child health, reproductive health, gender, equity, nutrition, WASH, and HIV. The second is Ms. Saloni Murlidara Hiriur. Ms. Murlidara Hiriur has been working as a senior coordinator at Seva Cooperative Foundation for three years. Her work includes developing ways to ensure growth and sustainability of informal women workers and their collective enterprises. She is also working on issues of meaningful digital inclusion, including through plat uh, platform cooperatives and was a fellow at the Institute of Cooperative Digital Economy. The third is Ms. Madhuri Dharwal. Ms. Ms. Dharwal is an associate director at Indus Action. She's a mentor to the Eastern Zone and leads the learning platforms team. Ms. Dharwal is an educator and policy enthusiast. She believes in systems reform and ensuring access to quality education, healthcare, and nutrition for every citizen. Her past areas of experience include teaching, coding, consulting, work on diversity, gender, and inclusion, among others. She has worked extensively with children and believes in the power of arts to convey ideas. We are so grateful for all, to all the speakers for joining us today for this critical discussion. We will start with a video that captures voices from the field, following which Dr. Nair will take over. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the CoreNet Online 2022, where we discuss learnings on resilience and resurgence from two years of COVID-19 in India. Over the last couple of years, waves of COVID-19 upended the everyday life of many across the world, not just through the disease, but also through the consequences of the long lockdowns. This plenary aims to highlight how people and systems, such as specialized collaboratives, crowdfunding platforms, and civil society organizations supported the system's response to the health and economic crisis. The communities faced several adversities, including illness with COVID-19, financial challenges, loss of paid work, lack of access to medication, inadequate access to food, and threats to personal safety. It was more severe for some than for others. We spoke to Dr. Divya Nair, Director of ID Insight, who is moderating today's session to elaborate on the nuances of financial challenges. You know, in the context of the pandemic, my sense is everybody was affected in various ways, whether it was health, but also, you know, uh, economic, social, mental uh, uh, influences. So 
there's a whole range of ways in which various groups were affected. But I think certain subpopulations really stand out. Um, you know, the first is, of course, the migrants. We all have those images of migrants, um, you know, walking back to, to their homes in rural India. And uh, we had also conducted some surveys uh, during the pandemic. So we conducted around eight surveys. And what we found uh, when we did the, these surveys um, early, around a month after the lockdown, was that uh, migrant workers were almost three times as likely as their rural counterparts to have lost employment during lockdown. The other group that was affected was, you know, even though men suffered higher mortality from COVID, women basically disproportionately were affected in a variety of ways. And uh, those influences continue even, you know, uh, currently. And some of the examples are specifically in the uh, context of employment losses, basically because of the kinds of jobs that women do uh, uh, related to the service sector, there was higher concentration of losses in, in that sector. Similarly, uh, we've all heard about, you know, uh, the high burden of unpaid work, especially for Indian women compared to men. Uh, estimates say that uh, Indian women, you know, spend about 9.8 times more uh, time on unpaid work than Indian men. And uh, specifically during the pandemic, that uh, you know, disproportionate burden was really high. The COVID-19 pandemic is a stark reminder that risk is more systemic than ever in a globalised world. What began as a health disaster quickly became a socio-economic crisis with long-term consequences, thus highlighting the urgent need for a whole-of-society approach towards prevention and risk-informed recovery and development. Consensus on what community resilience is, how it should be defined and what its core characteristics are does not appear to have been reached with mixed definitions appearing in the scientific literature, policies and practice. The definition of resilience itself changes depending on the discipline as well as the unit of analysis, individuals, groups or systems. Without getting into that debate and keeping in mind the context of this discussion, let's go ahead with a working definition. When we say community resilience, we refer to the capacity of and actions or activities undertaken by individuals or groups towards adapting successfully to disturbances that threaten viability, well-being or the development of what they construe as their community through harnessing resources available to them. We asked Dr. Divya Nair to elaborate on this further. One thing that I have studied in the past is, uh, you know, how do you kind of uh, define resilience? And it is a very complicated construct. But I think one a way to think about it is really that it's a resource that you can draw from. And it is limited in many ways, right? It's not uh, it's not unlimited. Um, and so basically, uh, you know, if you already have those resources, then it's much easier for you to be able to kind of bounce back. Um, and so building, providing communities with those resources, uh, whether it is uh, social capital, for example, you know, in a, in a rural context, or whether it is information about where to where they can get the resources that they need uh, in terms of their, you know, the, the services that are being provided uh, naturally or on the fly. So, the, so they're the informational kind of pieces. And then they're the financial pieces. So there's the social, there's the informational, the financial uh, pieces that are really important for communities to be able to uh, draw from each other, but also to be able to kind of uh, survive and thrive going forward. And, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to kind of provide these services consistently uh, despite shocks is what would I, in my mind, make, uh, keep societies or, you know, I'm talking about communities actually, keep communities resilient. Some of the words that kind of come to mind are, uh, there, there are these three words of uh, basically resist, recover and reconstruct. And, you know, the idea is very much that uh, you're, you're able to adapt and, you know, kind of come back to at least maybe where you started. We spoke to a few stakeholders who engaged with the vulnerable communities and provided them with necessary resources during this period. One key insight they shared was that while women were most likely to be more adversely affected during the pandemic, they were also the key group that continued to bolster community resilience during this period 
through self-help groups or other on-ground initiatives. To elaborate on this further, we spoke to SM Vijayanand and Sajit Sukumaran, who were involved with Kudumbashri, a poverty eradication scheme driven by women established in Kerala. So we decided they will not be parallel to the local governments, they will work with the local governments. And we should protect the autonomy of both, that is a critical decision. These are local organizations of the people, civic organizations, uh, and the uh, social organizations, the others are political organizations. So they need to work together and they need to talk to each other, they need to share uh, information, but one is not under the other, respect each other's autonomy. In the uh, individual context of COVID, what really happened was uh, the, the situation was very peculiar. So that communication channel or that system just dropped off in the in the uh, early period of the lockdown. But at the same time, Guru Mishri could uh, realize and uh, understand that there was a potential which could be tapped for communicating messages that the government wanted to tell the people, the health system on the integrity. That's where uh, you realize that over the years, you know, a large number of people in the system has uh, smartphones and have started uh, using IT as platform, apps, etc. And there were, in a very short time, there were uh, close to two lakh WhatsApp groups formed across the state at different levels. And uh, in no time, Around 22.5 lakh members are part of these groups. That's half of the Kurumishi membership base. But because of the neighborhood group uh, coverage or the orientation, this uh, kind of a communication system could take messages across the states to everywhere. Another insight we gained was regarding the importance of connecting vulnerable people to the schemes they were eligible for. In the face of large-scale job losses, people needed cash transfer more than ever before, as well as a quick understanding and clear information about entitlements. We spoke to Anike Dogar, founder of Hak Darshak, an organization that connects people with their entitlements through a simple technology platform to learn about adapting during this period. So one of the biggest challenges we faced was uh, in our entrepreneurship model was around patriarchy. Because what happened was that because of COVID, children, all the students started accessing school online. Men who were in urban areas as migrants came back to villages. So our women entrepreneurs didn't have access to smartphones anymore because they were the last in the line to get smartphones in the house. They are given the last priority, right? It is first given to the husband or a father or the children. So that impacted us. And our entrepreneur number went down. So we uh, we added a lot of new models. So we basically expanded our work. We have tripled our number of applications. Today we reach 150,000 families a month. Before COVID, we were reaching about 25, 30,000 families a month. Uh, so I think in terms of expanding our capacity to really uh, work with the interested organizations because, like I said, there is this real focus on welfare and social schemes. The second was we opened up new verticals. So we started, apart from informal workers and rural families, which is our core focus, we also opened up MSMEs. So we realized that there is a lot of social security, uh, and, uh, again, uh, formalization and government benefits there for small micro businesses, which are 90% of our uh, ecosystem. And we've also launched our own Yojana Kendras, which are our physical centers. So we innovated on the uh, execution piece, which I mean, thinking on only two main uh, aspects, which is scale and sustainability. The third key insight was on building economic resilience by supplementing for lost income due to the pandemic. This is where donors stepped in. The India Giving Report 2021 looked at everyday giving and found that 85% of the respondents had supported charities or their community in direct response to the pandemic. We spoke to Sumit Dayal, COO of Give India, a conscious crowdfunding platform to understand more about giving during the pandemic. So the, uh, the spike in donations, it wasn't even a growth. It was an enormous spike in donations which happened because what was happening on the ground touched a very deep emotional chord 
with people across the world. It of course mattered to people in India. It mattered to Indians, the Indian diaspora that was not here at that moment, could not be here, but was deeply connected to what was going on with their families here and friends and memories and everything, right? Um, it also affected deeply people whose organizations might have been in India, people who worked with Indian colleagues, for example. So we saw spikes happen in each and every segment of donors. Um, and it was simply because of the enormity of what was happening. We've seen 5x, 6x, 10x growths uh, that happened in the COVID period. That was the only reason why COVID relief could also happen at the scale that it did. Because all of it, especially the second wave, the first wave, if the focus was the migrant crisis, the intervention for a lot of uh, NGOs was meals, right? People did not have food. Uh, in the second wave, it was oxygen equipment. If you look at the cost per beneficiary of the two, oxygen equipment is drastically higher as compared to means, right? Uh, the money that you need for that is drastically higher than what it would be in the first wave. And the only reason that happened was because donations went through a massive spike. So Give India was running a cash relief program through the second wave. We were essentially giving a grant of 30,000 rupees to a family that had lost any member of the family due to COVID. And what is the situation in that family? That person who's no more could have been the breadwinner of the family, could have been a member of the family supporting the family in many different ways. And when a sudden loss in the middle of a crisis happens, you need the ability to get back on your feet. This is not sustenance for life. This isn't livelihoods. This isn't long-term systemic change. Men for family that has been hit very hard in the worst possible environment, needing some immediate assistance to get back on their feet from where they will find the way on what next. In the pre-pandemic world, we saw established processes that had been built over time to support vulnerable populations and enable financial, social and informational support systems. However, with the disruption of these processes and increasing vulnerabilities during the pandemic, communities, organizations and processes needed to adapt quickly in order to respond to existing and new requirements. So what should the future of resilience look like? It really needs systemic uh, system building and system building. Uh, what I like about, you know, the panel that we are, uh, we are putting together is that, you know, there's the government that has a responsibility to provide, uh, you know, a range of public services to its citizens. But uh, Along with that, you know, citizens also uh, really kind of are able to step in to at least connect to the state, but in some cases also kind of replace where the state is not able to provide services. And so in terms of the long term is, you know, of course, one is just increasing the pie and ensuring that like basic uh, services are available for um, for citizens. But apart from that is improving the efficiency of that you know, uh, by a, a variety of ways, uh, I think is what would really kind of help long-term, you know, welfare, I guess, which is the outcome that we're uh, trying to optimize for. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and I'd first like to you know thank all the panelists for being here uh, really excited to have you and uh, really looking forward to hearing about all the uh, you know incredible work that uh, your organizations have done uh, organizations and networks have been able to do uh, I also want to acknowledge Cornet to start with just because you know as a network they have been incredible during the the pandemic in terms of providing a platform for a range of partners to really discuss you know what's happening in terms of just uh, what are the challenges and then also what are potential you know ways forward and uh, you know for some of you who might not have been part of some of those discussions during the height of the pandemic it was this very energizing space 
uh, that used to come together with you know a hundred plus people talking about you know what's happening across the country and that's the kind of energy that you know it was just a small kind of uh, 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 example but that was the kind of energy that you know happened during the pandemic and uh, even you know at the, there's the saying that adversity is the mother of invention and I think that's kind of the focus of this uh, this panel is you know understanding that there were massive challenges unprecedented really um, and you know what happened how did uh, civil society and uh, uh, networks kind of step in to uh, to improve the situation and to really kind of um, um, help each other. And so uh, I'll start with, without much ado, um, uh, I think my first question I'd like to address to uh, Saloni and Madhuri um, on, you know, what were some of the vulnerabilities that you, um, you know, kind of saw in the work that you were doing and how did you address them? Uh, this kind of gives also the, uh, uh, the listeners a sense of, you know, what, what your organizations were focused on early during the pandemic. So over to you. Madhuri, maybe first. Sure, thank you. Um, hi everyone. Um, the topic that we're talking of, I mean, resilience in communities, I think just one thing that I'd like to highlight before I answer your question is that uh, when we mention community, I think what I'll be talking of is also multiple stakeholders. One is the vulnerable citizen that we're all here to serve, right? So citizens and their families that we're trying to serve, but also other civil society organizations, NGOs, for-profit bodies, and the government as well, because uh, we exist in an ecosystem where resilience can't be built in isolation. And so when I mention uh, community, I think I'll be speaking of this entire larger ecosystem. Uh, when we, uh, I think when the pandemic hit, it took all of us by surprise. And uh, some of these specific vulnerabilities that we saw, and I'll just list them out because there were just so many, and I'll uh, touch upon a couple of them with examples. Uh, so we saw income, as was mentioned already earlier, so some I won't uh, elaborate on, but income and job loss was something that we saw playing out quite a lot and how that was, and I'll just also provide an example of how you know uh, groups came together to support. So one example of that was that uh, governments provided aid to labor. So Delhi, Haryana, among mu multiple other governments provided 5,000 rupees as supplemental uh, income to labor because they weren't able to work during the months of the lockdown. Uh, when we talk of education is sort of the second vulnerability where everything shifted online, right, for everyone. And uh, anecdotally, we know that students' learning levels have really fallen drastically. There are multiple initiatives that governments took and private institutions as well. So there were Mohalla classrooms, mobile teachers. Uh, there were parents and communities that came together to teach in their own localities. The challenge with this one is that there isn't very clear m &E yet to showcase or to tell us, you know, how those uh, pieces fed. There is in bits and parts, but not as a very clear uh, whole. The gender gap, things that you already mentioned earlier, the way of domestic violence, the amount of housework that increased for women, girls dropping out more out of school. And there are organizations like uh, Educate Girls and Tap India really working on this uh, dropout issue of girls particularly, and that has been great. So that was another issue. The digital divide, never been clearer. Accessing, you know, be it accessing education, online working, access to welfare and social security schemes, all of these have kind of suffered. And that's something that we work on at Intersection, ensuring that there's access to social uh, welfare schemes. And there we realized that one of the ways in which we could help and, uh, you know, other organizations could also help was providing cell phones and tablets. Some state governments also did it, like for instance, in Kerala for education. And then there were other civil society organizations that fundraised uh, to get tablets and cell phones and other devices to students. Uh, the other ways were just doing telephonic surveys to help people enroll for these schemes. So there were surveys done, data collected about okay, how many people have not been able to enroll into a, a particular welfare scheme and then helping them get their documents together and enroll as the lockdowns lifted gradually uh, was some of that. And another group that we saw really 
facing vulnerability was people with special needs now uh, and i'll give an example of this we were working and we were working across multiple networks throughout you know both the waves all the third one as well partially but uh, during the first wave we realized that in delhi there was this group that got in touch with us and they were working with children with girls particularly uh, all of whom were on wheelchairs and now they had needed access to menstrual health care and a gynac uh, a gynac essentially but they weren't able to get it for about a month so the person who got in touch with us got in touch with us after a month and uh, the girls were facing a lot of issues the main challenge with them was that since they were all on wheelchairs there was no uh, one vehicle that could accommodate them and their wheelchair and take them to the hospital and all of them all together and so then we contacted the delhi government who they sent ambulances to them so they sent about 10 12 ambulances which could fit in uh, the girls with their wheelchairs and you know people in uh, to support them and then that got sorted so again we're seeing sometimes it was individual action sometimes uh, a group network ecosystem coming together but yeah these were a lot and i think the migrant labor uh, sort of mobility issue of the first wave i won't highlight more than we what we've spoken about already maybe i can take it up directly uh, first thank you so much for net for having me here um and to the panelists i'm really excited also to listen in apart from just speaking uh, i'll give you a bit of context to what i do so that you know where i'm coming from when i speak uh i represent the self employed women's association sevas cooperative federation uh, and we work with a collective enterprises owned managed governed by informal women workers uh and these are across sectors so we work in agriculture handicraft service sector uh laborers etc so wherever whenever i speak i'm speaking of these women now coming to the question uh we know this we know covid the pandemic was a triple crisis it was a health crisis it was an economic crisis it was a care crisis and we were all affected but those affected the most were those at the base of the pyramid and these were the workers that the uh, seva corporate federation works with informal women workers um there was a loss of lives there was a loss of livelihoods there was hunger there was an access to information this was particularly a, a vulnerability that was that was exacerbated they didn't know what covid was they didn't know what to do how to detect it um uh, so these were some of the individual level uh, vulnerabilities we saw and i won't go too much because the video so nicely put together everything uh, but one of the studies we did in the first wave from the federation uh, on on informal workers we found that 74% of the women we spoke to uh, had food insecurity issues they were going hungry and there was a 65% reduction in household income and this was a massive loss when you have a loss when you have nothing at all to lose even a little bit is is magnified to a very high level um at the cooperative level at the collective enterprise level because that's where we work we saw there were various disruptions in the supply chain women uh, traditionally don't have access to markets as much as other communities do um and this was exacerbated uh, and so they were selling at very low rates to middle agents and not getting money when they already were losing money uh the service sector as divya said in the video was completely stagnated right there was no way that domestic workers were going to be uh, were going to work we saw raw material prices go up we saw transportation costs go up uh but coming to the happy part in the face of all of this we saw communities adapt uh we saw women adapt particularly and lead this adaptation in their communities so in the agriculture sector for example where there was you know uh, they didn't have any money because they couldn't sell their harvest they didn't have money to purchase seeds for the next harvest season which uh you know threatened their continuation of livelihood so uh one of our cooperatives called megha mandali which is a cooperative of 1000 indigenous women farmers in the south of gujarat they put together seed capital so they were giving small money to farmers in communities to buy seed and they were also enabling access to the seed so they were the disruption wasn't there then of the of the agriculture cycle uh in the health sector our health cooperative started producing sanitizers uh, so that women had access to livelihoods they were making the sanitizers and they had access to income because they were getting profits from selling the sanitizer our handicraft sector workers are artisans they began making masks um in our in our domestic uh, work sector seva home care which is one of our cooperatives uh, they negotiated with employers to give at least some money to the women uh, so that they were able to run their households and in in a lot of cases the employers did give money but in cases where employers didn't the cooperative actually dipped into its own savings small savings but ensured that women had some money coming into their household 5000 rupees so just so they could buy basic provisions 
our insurance cooperative actually developed a COVID insurance product uh, and started uh, linking women to this, women who were in the front line, women, informal women workers generally across communities. And the last thing I want to say here is that this resilience uh, wasn't just limited to the women or their households, and not just even their cooperatives or collective enterprises, but the effects of this were spread in their entire communities. Uh, and we saw that shown through, or that came through in, in the COVID-19 pandemic, at the crisis that it was. Fantastic, thank you both. Uh, turning to Priyanka, Priyanka, uh, it would be great to kind of uh, hear a little bit about Giving Tuesday, you know, the, the initiative itself. Um, and you also mentioned that uh, you've done a research study on mutual aid in India, so it would be great to get insights on both. Over to you. Thanks, Divya. And it's just fascinating to, to have watched the video and then to have heard both Madhuri and Saloni speak because that's really what we've found with uh, the work that we've been doing. You know, we've all seen how traditional systems were completely overwhelmed, they were unprepared. And it was those mutual aid networks that were able to respond really nimbly. And they responded to feed, to clothe, to house, to educate, and to soothe fellow humans. And I think it's these movements that are organized, structured, human-led efforts that care and connect uh, to communities and that prevent suffering and bring healing and help with them that really are, um, you know, it's a, it's a collective and abundance mindset that's rooted in a sense of mutuality, of reciprocity, of radical trust. And what we've been able to do is, I think what's, what, what's been surfaced for everybody through the pandemic is that this ecosystem that exists has always existed, has just been brought much more to the front, has, it's become much more apparent for people because we've been in crisis. What we've done at Giving Tuesday is, so Giving Tuesday in general uh, recognizes how crucial it is to capture and measure and amplify the whole generosity ecosystem. Um, and this requires sort of looking beyond monetary transactions and exploring the many and different ways that people give back to their communities around the world. So what is Giving Tuesday? I can hear a lot of people asking. I asked the same question before I joined them. It is the global generosity movement that unleashes the power of people and organizations to transform their communities in the world. It was established in 2012 as a very simple idea. It's a day that encourages people to do good. It's grown since then into this global movement that inspires hundreds of millions of people every year to give, to collaborate, and to celebrate generosity the year round. So the movement is brought to life through a distributed network of entrepreneurial leaders. These are leaders who lead national movements in 80 countries, and they lead hundreds of community movements worldwide. Now, one of the unique sort of offerings of Giving Tuesday is the Giving Tuesday Data Commons, which is a collaborative of over 300 contributing partners and 50 global data labs. And the Data Commons is fundamentally the leading collaboration on giving and generosity. This is an open distributed network of partners working across sectors, working across borders, fundamentally seeking to understand the drivers and the impacts of generosity and to explore giving behaviors and patterns and fundamentally use this data and these learnings to inspire more giving around the world. Mm -hmm. So in 2021, Giving Tuesday launched something called the Giving Behaviors Survey that was delivered in partnership with Sector 3 Insights where we asked people in seven countries how they express a range of different giving behaviors. And that led really to our first broad view of patterns of non-monetary generosity around the world. Now, we're not saying that one form of giving is preferable over another. In fact, on the contrary, what we're seeing is that encouraging all types of giving begets more giving across the board. So our goal really is to develop a deeper understanding of the various creative and meaningful ways that people support their communities through neighborhood events, through mutual aid networks, other acts of community care uh, that help form this sort of grassroots safety net that you heard Saloni describe or that you heard Madhuri describe. And even the, all of this survives and thrives even as other systems are disrupted or overwhelmed. So what do we find? Um, in seven countries, that's Brazil, Canada, India, Kenya, Mexico, the United Kingdom, the United States. Uh, we conducted a, sample, a survey of a thousand people, a thousand individuals in each of these countries. Um, the timing of it is really interesting because it was launched 20th of August, 2021 and ran through till the 3rd of September. 
So just after the second wave in India, and that's, I think, useful context to think about what came out. And we asked a series of questions about what people gave in the last 12 months, money, things, time, or their voice. So where did they lend support? And to whom did they give that? So did they give this to a registered organization? Did they give it to a structured community group? Or did they just give this as unstructured ad hoc giving? We found that people around the world express their generosity in many ways. And no matter where, it is rare that people will give only in one way. So what that means is if people give money, they're likely to give in other ways as well. In many countries, we saw giving tends to happen through unincorporated networks rather than through registered organizations. And indeed, in places that exhibit strong cultures of giving, the mechanisms are not often dominated by nonprofit organizations or registered charities. And this is particularly true of India. Participants in those mutual aid networks tend to be more philanthropically inclined in general. Uh, they're less likely to see distinctions between various forms of giving or between giving to organizations and other recipients. So it's, it's a generosity mindset overall. And we found that generosity shows up in lots of different ways. And where you live informs how you give and what you're likely to give. So in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom, survey respondents were more likely to give money and goods to organized charities. Giving time and lending voice ranked lowest in those countries compared to the other countries. In Mexico and Brazil, sharing tangible goods like food or clothing via informal family or community networks represented the greatest share of giving behaviors. Giving is much less developed via legal charitable organizations in countries like Mexico. Interestingly, Kenya and India showed the strongest levels of pro-social behavior of all types. Much of it was ad hoc and unstructured, but givers in both these countries showed very high levels of volunteering and lending support or voice compared to the other countries surveyed. Indian respondents in particular demonstrated a great deal of pro-social behavior with a hybrid of traditional structured giving to charities and additional giving of items or things to individuals and neighbors. So really giving in all its forms. And the level of unstructured giving of things was much higher in, in, in India than it was in the USA, in Canada, or in the UK, which struck me as really interesting. Uh, volunteering and lending voice for causes were relatively lower in India than giving money or things, but it was still significantly higher than in the US, UK, and Canada. So what we took away from this, and this is a baseline, it's a one-time snapshot, we're hoping to get more data over time about these same indicators so we can see what's happening with giving behaviors. But what we took away from this was that individual giving is far more nuanced and diverse than just giving money to charities. Um, and in some cultures, obviously, giving goods, giving time is more valued than in others. Uh, but in all countries, it's absolutely rare that people do only one type of giving. Um, and it's really interesting, I think, to think about what that means when, it think, when we think about community resilience and how generosity plays into building resilience over time. It's really interesting, thanks. Um, yeah, I, it'll be great to hear also from Madhuri and Saloni on um, you know, what their experience has been in terms of communities and networks, um, in terms of how that they have helped in terms of build resilience. Um, also curious to you know, think about you know, who gets left out from these uh, networks and community kind of efforts. Uh, because, you know, when you talk about social capital, for example, there is the, the downside of it is that social capital often, you know, you're kind of um, off, uh, often working with the same kind of, you know, people within your community. How much is there of giving outside your community? Uh, and one more kind of layer to that is how did your uh, networks and communities um, work with government? And specifically, if you have good examples on that, it would be great to hear. Thank you. Uh, this time, let's start with Saloni. Uh, thank you for that question, Divya. So um, there was a crucial role that support systems, networks, movements, uh, particularly like where uh, I work, Seva Cooperative Federation, played at this time, uh, which was, you know, mentioned in the video, bringing the means to these communities to become resilient. Right? And of course, the first thing was relief. Um, relief resources, masks, sanitizers, soaps, food. Uh, this was distributed, but what I'd particularly like to highlight was that 
because of the decentralized model that we follow, uh, which is through communities, through women leaders, the distribution of these resources wasn't just quick, but it also reached those who needed it the most. And so this sort of answers your question about who gets left behind, right? The women were deciding that those with say disabilities, like Madhuri had mentioned, they get the resources first, or those who've lost all income, they get the resources first. Uh, and so this model allowed for that. Uh, and really relief was the first thing we reached. And here to answer your next question was that uh, Seva Cooperative Federation and Seva in general doesn't work to replicate what the government is doing. There is a very clear role that the state plays, must play. And we're here to sort of fill in the gaps or play a supportive role uh, in, therein. So that was the model that we follow. And this was also something that uh, Mr. Vijayanand said in the Kudumbashri part of the video, was that we work very closely in tandem with the government to uh, link and act as bridges between those who needed the resources and the state, which had the resources. The second thing which was important, which this, uh, the movements played was bridging the um, access gap, uh, bringing information on COVID care and protection, detection, particularly mental health and psychosocial care, which was, you know, not ignored, but less talked about during this time, but equally crucial. We also uh, uh, did a lot of work through telemedicine and creating referrals for people who needed hospital beds. Because you and I could go on Twitter or, or you know, and ask for oxygen. And, but the women we work with, they, they didn't have means, for that. they didn't have the ways to do this. So creating those bridges was something that networks really did. Um, coming to really the enterprise and the livelihood aspect of it, uh, I'd mentioned some of the business pivots that our enterprises made, you know, uh, making masks, making sanitizers, but they were able to do this because they had a women's enterprise support system, which is Seva Cooperative Federation, which enabled them to make those pivots. So when they needed uh, money to buy material for mask production, we were able to invest in these enterprises, get them working capital, uh, get them capacity and training so that they could learn how to make these masks. And also, and I will come to that a bit later, a digital literacy, which was really the need of the hour at this time. Um, we also tried to find new markets, digital markets, which these small cooperatives, small collectives don't, don't have the resources to do on their own. So the Federation played this bridge um, and these inputs and the support enabled, uh, like I said earlier, enabled these small enterprises to have the means to be resilient. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Aluni. Uh, I think a lot of the things that you've said already, you know, in terms of how um, we can, like how resilience needed to be built. I think I echo a lot of what you've shared. And uh, in the work that we started doing during uh, the first wave of the pandemic, we were, as a lot of other organizations, a little clueless, including the government, right? We were all scrambling to understand what is the pandemic? What do we sort of, how do we react to this? And we realized that our first steps, the best steps could be to reach out to the families who we already were in touch with. So uh, in this action works on legislated rights and getting access to them for vulnerable citizens. And so we had been working in the areas of right to education and right to food. And uh, those were sort of the ones also that get left behind, right? The mothers, uh, pregnant mothers, children who are just newly born in need of immunization. Uh, those were groups we realized were being left behind. Education was something that was not at all a priority. And uh, so definitely something that was totally left on the side of the table. And in a way, understandably so, because at that moment, it wasn't the most, uh, like it wasn't first priority. So there we realized that for building resilience, if we had to do it in the short run, there are, you know, immediate steps that can be taken just to ensure that we survive or we get out of um, that current situation that we're in. But if we want to ensure that it is there or resilience is built in for the longer run within these vulnerable groups, then the community needs to be made aware of what their rights are, uh, who do they go to when they're in trouble, what are grievance redressal mechanisms built in for them. So there are CM helplines working in, say, a state like MP. West Bengal is something called Didi Ke Bolo. Do people know of these? Are they able to access them at all? Uh, there are Gram Sabhas, Gram Panchayats that have certain uh, norms for grievance redressal for even information around COVID. You know, uh, there was there were plans made to decentralize all of this information sharing, but obviously the frontline workers had so much uh, load on them that it didn't quite play out the way it was planned either. So 
the first thing that we realized in resilience and if it has to be made long term is that the there needs to be both a demand and a supply side pressure right so the community needs to be able to ask uh, for what is rightfully theirs and the government is it is their duty to be providing irrespective right even if the community asks or doesn't it is their duty to be providing welfare in how they need to so uh, networks and movements there we saw in the first wave i think we we worked with uh, rss workers with congress youth congress with uh, groups from the seek uh, groups serving langar and other food uh, and ration things we worked with ips officers across i think different states there were multiple instances where um, there were both civil society organizations and then individuals in the government were acting more as individuals that came forward so in the first wave we saw a lot of that that the entire uh, yeah the civil society organization was the stronger network in that first wave i think that came together really cohesively to showcase that okay yeah we are here we can support whatever is required and in the second wave then we realized that uh, the government in some ways at least for what they didn't repeat what were issues in the first wave there were newer ones that came up in the second wave i think but the first wave uh, the challenges that we saw at least a lot of those they had plans to mitigate them and uh, we work at intersection a lot with state governments and with the union government in terms of uh, enhancing capacity for welfare delivery and uh, two examples that i gave of you know things that were helpful uh, so during the first wave and partly in the second wave we weren't able to be on the ground all the time right uh, so because of lockdowns etc so in chatisgarh we worked with the labor and the panchayati raj departments our strengths we realized were uh, mne understanding data quickly and then the quick utility of that data right we were not sitting here to do research on that data to understand what's going to happen four years down the line we needed to see how can that data be utilized immediately for welfare and uh, so there we provided information really quickly on uh, we coordinated for migrant labor traveling into chatisgarh so for, uh, those who so state uh, home state was chatisgarh and were traveling from about eight different states my uh, majorly from eight different states and ensuring that the labor is sitting on trains getting you know and what station do they come to how do they reach with all of the covid protocols and norms and one incident that stays with me very clearly is of uh, a train that had left from a particular state where there was some confusion i'm uh, not naming the state but there was some confusion there on uh, you know how many labor are getting on what's and where is it supposed to go etc and they about 350 labor got on with no food or water traveling for over 24 hours Uh, so it was far off from chatisgarh and uh, so we and as you said saloni we had please had the privilege to tweet about it right they didn't and so we tweeted an ips officer in chatisgarh saw it reached out to his fellow officer in a different state uh, which was en route and ensured that the families got food and water after i think over 12 hours they got food and water and uh, that was so i mean in a way you know networks and movements twitter i think was one of the best things that happened at that point where everyone was reaching out and everyone was helping so that's one example and then another example that i give is um, when in delhi we conducted a quick mne study to just understand with the mothers that we were working with were they getting access to panjeeri and moongfali so these are nutritious supplements given to pregnant mothers and just uh, lactating mothers as well pregnant women and uh, we realized in like a quick survey of about say 200 calls that uh, most mothers weren't getting it now the like one thing was just to say oh the government's not providing it you know nobody wants to give them then inefficient system but then we work, spoke to the anganwadi workers in those areas and they said that you know it's very difficult to carry 20 kilos of pangeri and moongfali to these households because of the covid restrictions they are, weren't able to get help and five people can't go in a group and they've reduced things etc and so the solution was very simple right like they were given an auto that would just go with them and deliver this in uh, whichever gullies they were going into so i those were ways in which i think like two examples where we could su- support the government and supplement their efforts because every organization or group would have its own uh, strengths and so there i think these were two areas that we were able to help great thanks um you know i like the mentions also of data and i think you know we should do a hat tip to the people who put together the you know covid-19 platform also there was this like again 
uh, this you know group of young individuals who uh, outside of their organizational affiliations just got together and connected data sources that really were essential in terms of understanding what the, these waves looked like and you know there was in terms of geographic distribution etc um, but you know one mention that has happened a few times is in terms of the tools that have been used especially technology right um, so it would be great to hear a little bit more about how technology was used during the pandemic and also going forward right like because once that kind of technology uh, you know, uh, has reached certain populations or certain initiatives, then I'm assuming that it continues uh, currently. And, you know, what does that look like? So maybe starting with Priyanka first and then uh, Saloni and Madhuri. Thanks, Divya. I mean, there's just so much to talk about when it comes to networks and the power of those networks. And I think one of the stories that I have about the use of technology was driven really by um, the, the Giving Tuesday leader in India. Uh, this is Pushpa Aman Singh, who's the founder and CEO of GuideStar India. And, you know, under her leadership, she, Giving Tuesday has done a lot. But I think what happened really globally, and this is, again, the power of networks and how they can sort of be prepared in communities in a different way, um, was that when the pandemic hit and everybody was scrambling, the network, the global network of leaders came together and realized very clearly that generosity is the value that will create sort of healing connection and resilience in the face of this pandemic that was leaving people overwhelmed, isolated, feeling really powerless. So they came together and mobilized around the 5th of May 2020 and they created something called Giving Tuesday Now. And this was this massive activation that they, that they ran in all 80 countries simultaneously. Lots of different stories came out of Giving Tuesday Now in India. But the one that I love is the partnership with DonateCart, which is a long-term partner of Giving Tuesday in India. And I don't know how many of you know DonateCart, but they're basically a crowdfunding platform that allows people from around the globe to donate towards products that are required by nonprofits in India. So DonateCart partnered with Giving, with Giving Tuesday in India, ran 38 campaigns and reached about an estimated million people globally. And this is all in, a, in the space, put together in, a, in, in six weeks and run over a, a week um, around the 5th of May. Um, and those campaigns then raised donations of over a crore, which allowed them to then support community groups like daily wage workers, doctors, the elderly, the poor, stray animals, and it's just, it's because those partnerships existed, because technology exists, and because you can actually think about how you can tie those different networks together to create something that really provides exponential value. Um, but I think it is also, it's important, I think, for us to remember that, that technology is meaningless without people and without that human connection to drive it. So that's one of the really sort of strong things that comes out for me every time I think about what's happening at Giving Tuesday. So, I mean, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the communities. So particularly in rural India, there is a whole model of people being in very close contact. People walk into each other's houses. There is a very proximal relationship that people share. And this got taken away, um, even in urban India, but largely in rural India. And there was an immediate need then to make these connections. And now digital was the only means to do that. But what the network, what Seva Cooperative Federation did uh, was very quickly um, start digital literacy programs. Now, women, of course, traditionally don't have access to mobile phones, but because there was a lockdown and everybody was in the household, we saw that the household had one mobile phone, at least, which the woman was allowed to use for some time. So in that time, you were able to deliver these digital literacy programs, teaching them how to use, you know, a WhatsApp, how to, how to do conference calls if they didn't have a smartphone, how to make calls and send messages, etc. And then using this uh, literacy, we were delivering our health messages on, uh, through small audiovisual formats, you know, what is COVID, what, how do you wear a mask properly, et cetera, et cetera. We also delivered uh, small games that children could play because Anganwadi's were shut now uh, and using household tools, what are some games, uh, educational games that you can play with your child. All of this information did reach the women digitally. Apart from that, because they were running collective enterprises, there's a whole operational or administrative or governance aspect to it, which now had to be done. If you're doing so much work, which requires you know, constant communication, you, you, are, you do need digital tools. So they were able to learn Google Meet and Zoom and 
uh, what you said there was too they're still losing it now to connect because they find it easier and it is easier uh, however i do want to point out that there was a contextual disparity there our members in nagaland and uttarakhand you know in hilly areas uh, there was no network they couldn't use these phones so there is coming back to the role of the state there is a role that the state plays now when we talk about meaningful digital inclusion at the uh, sort of more macro level uh, when we started when the vaccine came out right there was a covid app that we now all had to use uh, and so when our uh, health workers were initially doing covid related information now they were trying to help uh, individuals in connecting to the application so they could get the vaccine uh, one other thing we tried to do and this again is an ongoing piece of work is uh, the government has a public procurement policy and there's a public procurement platform which is the government e marketplace which is a completely digital platform uh, built for transparency um and we saw during the time of covid because our health cooperative was making sanitizers it could have sold through a gem uh, gem portal however there were issues uh, the portal wasn't made keeping the women in mind things like interface complexity or language inclusion and it was only in english initially uh and this is an ongoing conversation we're having currently with gem to enable the sale of products and services both uh, created by women's collective enterprises um what i'd mentioned early on was the the role that federation played in connecting to digital markets uh through social media marketing uh, through whatsapp marketing uh and and we are continuing our work on digital inclusion with the emergence of this new gig, gig economy the digital economy because there is a fear and which often happens is that women who are at the base of the pyramid uh are will be left behind so what can we do to make sure that that gap doesn't happen is an ongoing uh, area of exploration for the save up electric sector uh so i think the digital interventions in multiple ways i mean in terms of uh gaps i think all of us are aware right education welfare provision financial literacy and banking and the gender gap in those were four uh that priyanka and saloni also touched upon and uh what i specifically you know highlight is that when we looked at education there is there were portals there were uh multiple initiatives that were created to bridge this digital divide so uh, for instance kerala had something called a first well they had done an extensive study figured out how many children didn't have uh, the kerala government i mean figured out how many children didn't have access to uh, digital infrastructure and then provided that to them come up with a program uh, ran that chatisgarh had something called padhai tu hardwar which means uh, education at your doorstep and they started something called bultu ke bol which is they just play on words on bluetooth and so essentially saying areas which don't have network uh, how can they get access to the material that's being provided and so that then was taken uh, you know downloaded in areas where there was network and then uh, given to other teachers using bluetooth devices etc so multiple states and i think almost all state governments have come up with some initiative or the other union government had the vidya portal where they tried to put in material and uh, you know but i think where the challenge came in was that this divide is still very extreme right uh, children who are able to access despite all the material being provided is very limited uh, is learning happening after that or not was still a big question mark and something that we're yet to answer but at least these initiatives were taken uh, and by the government by the communities as well and that's something i'd mentioned earlier of you know how parents and communities were coming together to do that the second thing that we realized with welfare provision um, and the digital divide because as what soloni was saying right now right multiple interface like just looking at that 22 page form that you need to fill out for a maternity benefit uh, which will give you 5000 rupees in three tranches i wouldn't want to fill that out ever and so i don't think a pregnant mother who doesn't know how to read doesn't know what documents she has would ever want to do any of that and so there were certain areas where online registration for schemes was started making it easier like that's something that i saw uh, coming and it was that government also realizing really that they could not continue with the system of uh, having either such lengthy or incomprehensible sort of uh, you know online interfaces wherever there is online a lot of places are still offline but wherever it is online at least that this could not continue so that for instance for uh, jandhan yojana 
there were offline um, booths created and Jandhan Yojana essentially gives about 500 rupees for every woman who has a, a Jandhan account. They get 500 rupees in their bank account. And so, uh, and, I mean, with certain criteria attached, but uh, that was something that a lot of women couldn't apply for during the pandemic if they hadn't applied for previously. And so there were centers set up to help them apply during just when the first lockdown was lifted, et cetera, to make life easier there. So financial literacy in banking I'm not getting into is one huge Pandora's box where we're seeing not only a gender divide, a rural urban divide, uh, women not having bank accounts in their own names or you know mobile numbers being given to uh, are of their husbands, the Jandhan, Aadhaar mobile sort of linkage, that jam issue that came up was, so these were some of, I think, other challenges with financial literacy and banking. Uh, there are organizations working towards that as well to make women more aware of, uh, you know, banking and financial literacy. And I think a couple of other things that we did, uh, particularly as Indus Action as well, was that we worked with labor departments in uh, three states where we tried creating, you know, shorter WhatsApp videos for access of entitlements that come under those departments specifically and very short uh, in regional languages and to be transmitted across all of the registered construction worker uh, you know phone numbers that are already there with the department so IVRS, IVRS messages as well as uh, utilizing WhatsApp for that uh, a lot of WhatsApp chatbot work happened for digital intervention so WhatsApp chatbots became like a very very used tool I don't think uh, outreach wise it is, you know, reaching every, reaching the last mile, but at least 70%, 75% of people it would reach like that last 25%. I don't think we ended up reaching. Um, and along with that, I think one group in terms of building this resilience is a lot of uh, the government shifting to online modes of working in certain areas, which is pretty poor, like in terms of their uh, online interfaces and working has not been too great. And so them shifting to that was a very positive move because, uh, you know, interacting with the government officer over Zoom was something that we had not done earlier. And that was happening. And I think in building ecosystem resilience is something that's very crucial because that's also removing a barrier uh, of access for people. So I think yeah, digital interventions, a lot of them that uh, push the community because I don't think there's any going back from this now. We're in a day and age right now where it digital and technology is the way forward it's not the end it's a means to some end but uh, i don't think we can survive without it and so very crucial that we look at all of the interventions that have happened and what can we learn from them what are things that can be improved but you know not dismissing them either as things that didn't work uh, because there is a gap yeah so maybe you know i think i prefer us looking at an, a more balanced approach because from where we were in 2020 as Digital India to where we are right now, I think we made a giant leap. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Um, so kind of, um, you know, I, it'll be great. You know, there've been so many interesting ideas and thoughts here. Um, and I feel like I've had my opportunity to ask questions, but I'll just let you all uh, put in you know, some final thoughts in terms of uh, topics that you haven't touched on, but, uh, you know, broadly, it'll be good to hear about what you, you think are the ways forward in terms of this topic of resilience also, right? Like how does one uh, support a community resilience and um, specifically if it's possible to think of it from a systems perspective, uh, but, uh, but yeah, all of us, I guess, especially uh, Saloni and Priyanka are part of these networks. Um, but yeah, uh, I will pass to Saloni this time and uh, Priyanka and Madhuri. And then uh, it would be great to get questions from the audience. So please do type in questions, but I think you can also unmute and ask questions after this round. So looking forward to those questions too. Uh, thank you, Divya. So I think the pandemic has brought with it a lot of lessons that we can carry forward, right? Like what Madhuri was saying, what you've been saying. And I think for Seva Cooperative Federation, one of the most crucial ones has been uh, that our model of collectivization did hold up, was resilient. And so there is a need to organize smaller cooperatives, smaller collective enterprises, organize largely informal women 
workers into these collective entities uh, and couple that with investing into these uh, as engines of promoting local growth, uh, enabling local employment. And we are seeing drops in youth employment and women's labor force participation, but these can become engines to sort of bridge that gap. Uh, and therefore, we also need support for these networks that we've been talking about so much. Because ne these networks act as support systems and uh, enable these small collectives to not operate in silos, but to actually talk to each other and to talk to the external world. So networks need to be promoted so they can be closed to the uh, collectives and they can provide constant, continuous support to the collectives. And second, this is the role of the state very crucially is universal social protection. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that you need basic health uh, insurance and childcare for informal women workers. And this has to be non-negotiable. So investing in these, investing in health needs to come from the state. Um, and all of this, uh, so these are the large, sort of large two points that I feel are key, broader level lessons for the future. And uh, all of this needs a push from policy. And so the final thought I have, and I'll be brief so we have time for questions, is that any policy decision uh, that reaches, that is supposed to reach these women workers cannot be made for the women workers. It has to be made, made with the women workers. So they need to have a say, they need to have a seat at the table, they need to have voice and representation. If you actually want the benefits or the fruits of what you're designing to reach the women, uh, people it's intended for. So let me jump in there and I say, and, and say, Saloni, I completely agree with what you've said, uh, particularly with, you know, I think what all of us as citizens need to perhaps, well, expect and demand from, um, you know, government systems. But I think where Giving Tuesday's focus is, is something that I think speaks to me very personally as well, because it is really the power of human beings and, and, and the power that every single individual has. And it's about, deconstructing that and sort of making it much more democratized so it's not you know it's not generosity if you have a million dollars to give everybody has the ability to be generous in their lives with whatever they have and that doesn't have to mean that you have money to give and i think it's that that sense of generosity that sense of seeing other human beings of not being able to turn away from need it's those sort of fundamental um, changes and shifts in human behavior that I think will help us kind of build this interconnected world. I mean, we're already, it's already an interconnected, interdependent world. And I think it's, it's really being able to leverage that to create this world that we have the opportunity to reimagine right now. And that sense of shared humanity, that sense of being able to be there for each other is I think what is gonna bring us much closer to resilience than if we sit back and wait for somebody else to do it for us. So I think the two things have to go side by side. I think while there is a demand for systems to step up, I think there's equally a demand on ourselves and on fellow human beings to bring their best selves to life. And I'm going to agree with what both of you have said. And uh, just in addition, I think the one of the biggest learnings that uh, we've had during the pandemic and the way forward is interdependency, right? We cannot work in silos. And to that, I think, be it systems or individuals, I think the first thing moving forward is states need to talk to each other, right? We don't see that happening at all. The migrant labor issue showed us that the source state and the home state, they both need to be responsible for the labor that's coming in and they're not. The union and the state governments need to talk to each other. We had no number uh, of the migrant labor when the pandemic started. And then the World Economic Forum recently had said that there's about 13 crore migrant labor, right? Uh, the states didn't have a number. The union government didn't have a number. And so they need to talk to each other. And more importantly, the databases need to talk to each other. That's the third point, that there are databases collected across different departments, across different organizations, surveys. I don't even know how much data we collect on a day-to-day -day basis, but nothing talks to each other, right? Uh, families need to know what their ration card detail and labor welfare and education benefits are in one place. They need to know what access, they do, should not need to submit the same document about 50 times over for accessing three different entitlements. And so these databases definitely need to talk to each other. And I think uh, a fourth point is that civil society organizations 
and NGOs, we really need to collaborate more. We don't, right? It's very easy to put it out on the government saying that, that uh, they need to really do something. But we are very stuck to our own ways of working, our mission, vision, you know, uh, how is of how we're doing, what target populations we target. And we very often forget to set that aside and really collaborate when a crisis is over. During the crisis, definitely we're all in, all together. But once that has passed, we're back to our own silos of working. And I don't think that can work. So if we are to build this resilience for like a longer term, we need to also, as CSOs, kind of look inward and say, okay, where are we really collaborating? Where are we open to doing that and uh, you know changing that? And I think moving forward, just the last point that I mentioned was also about a ground up demand. Uh, so there needs to be both demand and supply happening simultaneously. And so I think that's the last wave in terms of moving forward that we need to ensure that our communities are, uh, I don't like the word empowered, honestly, but for the lack of a better word right now, uh, you know, able to sort of take up their own challenges and fight for, like champion their own causes. So how are we able to do that? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I am opening this up now for questions. We do have a few questions that I can ask and as others think of more questions that they want to ask. Um, one of the questions is, uh, what are some of the on-ground adaptations that agent networks have made in order to uh, connect to entitlements? I think Madhuri, that question is for you. Um, yeah, pass it on to you. Sure. Uh, so I'm not sure I got agent networks, honestly. If Shreya, if you want to just clarify that. Um, hi, sure, Madhuri, thanks. Basically, the, the question was to ask if, uh, you know, you connect with uh, networks in order to facilitate, uh, you know, these, like these pieces of information that you give to the people that, um, that you try to serve, how, how do these uh, networks have to adapt in the face of COVID in order to sort of be more agile and give, um, you know, information in like a quicker and more precise way, also in the face of new uh, policies that come out and, uh, you know, that are tailored towards COVID response? All right. So I think uh, some ways in which people have had to adapt and really, you know, change quickly. One is their language of communication and modes of communication. So sometimes and in states where there are tribal languages spoken, you know, translating those really quickly from even Hindi to some of those tribal languages or English to local languages. So translation language of uh, communication, earlier it could have been done at a slower pace or it's reaching few people and some not, but now that was something which was tangibly uh, really quickly required. A second was the on-ground forces. So there were still people who were working on the ground, be it government networks or uh, civil society networks. And so how did they work with uh, protection? Because the pandemic was for them as well. So how did they really, you know, was there any sort of care given to these frontline workers? We realized out was that it wasn't very much. And so precautions, people did try to take those uh, precautions. And, but a lot of change was required there on how much do you allow people to go on ground, how much not, uh, you know, where is it that you draw a line? So I think those were two immediate things that come to mind. Um, I can also come in there really quickly, but yeah, I've dropped a, a link in the chat. Uh, I haven't talked about the Seva Shakti Kendra model, uh, the SSP model, which Seva has been running for many years now, which is really what I've been talking about, a decentralized model of information sharing, of entitlement sharing. Uh, and these are women, Agevans, as we call them, women leaders, uh, who are able to get you information on the latest schemes that you're entitled to actually help you write in the forms, connect with the schemes, uh, including COVID. Uh, we did this during COVID as well. Uh, but also refer you to various hospitals as you need it, because you know it's hard to get referrals to government hospitals. You don't know where to go. You don't know how to approach them. Um, and uh, I won't go more into that, but you can read this report in the Seva Shakti Kendra model, which really is the on-ground, ongoing support, uh, linking people to entitlements. Um, does anybody want to kind of, uh, yeah, uh, we have 
one more question, but I'm just wondering if others want to unmute and ask. Is that possible, Shreya? I'm not sure. Mm, I'd, I'd ask Rohan to answer that's that question. Right. I don't think that's possible. But um, yeah, please do jump in if you have more questions um, on any of these aspects that, you know, there's been so much covered. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'm going to ask one more question from the audience on, uh, you know, this is, I think, a measurement question almost, is how does one account for the contributions of care, that, you know, whether they're paid or, or especially unpaid work? Uh, to understand uh, the performance of society and the economy. Uh, maybe to Saloni first. Um, also, I think Divya, maybe you should answer this also. Yeah. It's a really well placed to answer this as well. Um, I think, I mean, that's a tough question, right? Um, because unpaid care work is really what's driving, uh, uh, subsidizing uh, the value or the economy or the value of the economy. Uh, and so maybe there isn't much incentive for the state to recognize it, uh, if I can put it that bluntly. Uh, the ICDS or the Anganwadi system has brought some measure of what does childcare, what value does childcare bring into the system. And perhaps this is a stepping stone to now account for what does maybe a full day childcare, what is full day childcare and pay, which is not what the Anganwadi system is currently. Uh, so there are steps that are being taken. I think there's a whole, there's a crucial role that research plays, which is why you know Vidya said that maybe we should put this up uh, into bringing into light uh, and maybe bringing a value or figure into what uh, uh, what unpaid care work uh, entails and how it contributes to the economy and how it also stops women from participating fully in the labor market and therefore uh, bolstering the local economy uh, the way we know it. But I'll I'll leave this in the very safe hands of Vidya. Yeah, um, I can just share like an uh, insight from the surveys that we did uh, during COVID. Um, and, you know, basically what one of the surveys that we did, we interviewed both the, uh, the male and female head of the household with the, within the same household. And what we found was because of increased unemployment, uh, there were more men uh, who were, you know, so it's, this was rural India. Uh, and so there was there were more men in the house, uh, but the work that they were doing was, you know, the, the time, obviously we were asking about time, the time that they were spending was often on uh, some kind of livelihood, you know, uh, work, whereas what the women were doing was on care, right, like the extra, in terms of taking care of children, and that's a topic that I feel we maybe didn't spend enough time on, it's just in terms of the huge effects of um, COVID on, uh, you know, learning losses, of course, but also in terms of childcare that um, households had to kind of uh, support. And uh, yeah, in terms of measurement, I would say that's an active area that, you know, we're all kind of looking into is what are the implications of this? Uh, but I think just first getting a sense of what 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 is the scale of unpaid care and of, um, uh, unpaid work also, you know, in terms of um, basically outside the household, uh, but still uh, informally, I think, you know, these are all areas that we've been looking at. I can also put in uh, some links in the chat shortly. We have one more question and I think we're almost at time, but- uh, yeah, Before you move on to another question, can I just add another perspective to the question about yes. unpaid work? I think the one thing, I mean, yes, it's absolutely about measuring it. It's absolutely about how it's, you know, how, how we think about it. But I think it is in that what's the what's the role of communication? I'm putting my old hat back on over here to say that unless we actually create value around unpaid work, it doesn't matter how much you measure it and it doesn't matter how robust that research is and what it tells you, unless that value proposition is really strongly created, it's not going to go anywhere. So I think there is a, a significant role in, you know, communicating to people who are participating in unpaid care, to people who are benefiting from unpaid care and from to a wider sort of policy environment that is, as Saloni pointed out, really, you know, usefully that has an interest in not necessarily acknowledging unpaid care. Absolutely, totally agree. Um, yeah, I have more things to say there, but I will not. Uh, in terms of 
really fully agree. Uh, I think the last question, and this is a good, you know, question in terms of uh, ending, is uh, has the cri uh, crisis made it easier to talk about building resilience? Um, and particularly, you know, in our own lives, uh, uh, basically, does this change our attitudes and behaviors uh, towards resilience? Uh, I do think it was a life-changing, you know, experience for everybody, but uh, happy to hear what others think and how you would articulate the, you know, this experience um, in terms of your personal lives, but also maybe, you know, then kind of stepping out in terms of others' personal lives. So Madhuri, starting with you this time, and then uh, Priyanka and Sloni. Uh, I think a very heavy question to answer, but uh, the, I think uh, two ways in which, say for me personally, and what I've seen play out in the ecosystem uh, where people's attitudes and behaviors have changed is one that, um, you know, every individual action counts. And uh, that's something that I've seen play out with myself, you know, if I was doing individual fundraising or reaching out to like a million networks to get access for different things. I saw it within my organization. I saw it within multiple other organizations and people I know. So I think that every individual action counts is something that uh, keeps playing over and over and has been like, yeah, that's something that really stood out for me and has uh, like, that's changed a little for me in the way that I'm operating. And I think the second is something that I think I've been talking about this entire uh, one and a half hours now is uh, about collaboration. So I don't think that we can, while every individual action counts, I don't think we can do things just alone and by ourselves. That we need to support, we need, like we need support and we need to support both. Uh, people around us, things that are happening that are going well, things that are not going so well and uh, the fact that it's always easier to point fingers than to really do something about something. So that I feel has changed a lot because we felt that that helplessness that uh, comes with not being able to help people or, you know, not being able to get that hospital bed or uh, see a family member suffer. And that I think is something that is uh, inherently shifted that for me that, you know, the system is what we're allowing it to be. Uh, we're part of that same system. It is our role and responsibility equally to be pushing where we need to uh, to ensure that it moves in a way that is uh, equitable for everybody and yeah so I think those have been major shifts and changes in attitude and then that's leading to behavior change in the way that I'm operating as an individual as you know our organization is working in terms of collaborations or ecosystem thinking yeah So I think rather than talking about this particular crisis, I think it's really useful to think about, uh, and again, I'm, I'm going back to my old hat and looking at what we've learned over the years about how communities respond when it comes to resilience. And I think it's a universally acknowledged truth that when there is a crisis underway, then everybody's thinking about protection, right? You're always thinking about how do you, how do you protect yourself? How do you protect what's closest to you, what you value the most, your family, your livelihood, your assets. That's what people are sort of focused on very much. And I think as the crisis becomes more normalized, as I think it has become for a lot of us now, you know, two years and counting, it's part of everyday life, you find yourself slipping with behaviors that you were very, very proactive about at the beginning. So how many of us are washing hands as compulsively as we used to at the beginning, right? So how many of us are wearing our masks regularly? I think it's there is something really important in that to think about how communication needs to adapt, how it needs to shift focus as you go through different phases of the pandemic. And it's not a one size fits all. So what you'd be communicating about in 2020 is going to be very different today. And I think in order to kind of really sort of create that stimulus to get people thinking about how do you strengthen what you have so that you have that bedrock of resilience 
needs to take people outside of the immediate crisis and start thinking much more into the future. That's a big, that's a challenge for anybody, right? Because what's invisible, what's so far in the future is really hard to respond to. So how do you make that much more immediate? How do you make that tangible? How do you make that real without creating fear? Because at the same time, you don't want people to be panicking and you don't want to exacerbate sort of that, that sense of powerlessness and that sense of disillusionment, that sense of disconnectedness that I think a lot of people are, are coping with. So it's not an easy answer, but I think it's a really crucial question. Um, I'll, I'll maybe stick to answering the second part of the question, which is where are we seeing attitudes and behaviors changing? And, and I completely resonate with what, what Priyanka and Madhul have said. Uh, I think with the communities, with the workers, the women that we work with, uh, there has been a more there, there has been an attitude now of safeguarding, like what Priyanka said, right? How do we protect ourselves? Because if there's another way, we don't know what to do. Where would we go? Uh, so that that uh, motivation to save, uh, to invest in care, to invest in healthcare insurance, uh, to really protect lives and livelihoods is stronger. And I'll give you two examples in the way we saw this. Uh, one was with the domestic workers example that I gave really early on. That even in the pandemic, the work had stopped. The workers in the cooperative were getting some money. Now, in that community of these domestic workers, women who were not part of the collective saw this, and they, they had a renewed sense in joining this collective. And that, that is very reaffirming to an organization like Seva Cooperative Federation, right? that the spirit of collectivism, and there is a power that that brings, is reinstilled. Um, and so that was a huge lesson for us. Uh, the other thing is that women are they're workers, they're cognizant of the fact that their businesses, their work was hit. And so they're now already strategizing on how do we protect this? So a farmer I speak to, Lata Ben, she says, okay, I, I sell vegetables, I sell uh, crops, but tomorrow if the supply chain is hit, I now also want to start selling poultry so that if this goes away, I also have that. So that, that idea of how do I protect myself through my work is also something that is renewed, uh, that is reaffirmed. Uh, and therefore, our work as the cooperative federation becomes that much easier because there is a there is a willingness of women to you know collaborate, uh, communicate, to uh, collectivize, uh, and that spirit of collective, that spirit of community, and the social and solidarity economy, which the ILO is now going to be talking about increasingly, uh, is reaffirmed. Great. It looks like we are in on perfect time. Um, I'm not going to summarize, but I will, you know, one key takeaway for me from this discussion is that, um, you know, ma many of us uh, as organizations and individuals and networks, basically in the face of the pandemic really stepped up our game, right? It, we had to kind of go over and above and innovate and um, kind of uh, figure things out. And I think the question that, you know, seems to be emerging from this is how do you keep that high level of engagement uh, and not let it kind of die down and you know like sustain that energy uh, despite uh, you know in, in better circumstances basically and what will it take to kind of continue that uh, that that inertia of momentum in a way right um, and so it, it's been fantastic to hear from all of you in terms of the like how you kicked off various um, uh, you know, initiatives and innovations and all of that. And uh, wish you all the best in terms of continuing. And uh, thank you so much for everybody's time, especially also for the attendees. I, I know that this is recorded and, you know, it'll be shared further. Uh, thanks in particular to Shreya and Rohan and the Cornet team also. And uh, really appreciated uh, this discussion. Thank you so much, Divya, and to all the panelists and the contributors to the video as well. Um, very, very glad to have you all here. And had a, this was an extremely insightful discussion. So thank you all. And thank you to the attendees as well. So good evening, everyone. Hope you have a good rest of the evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.